Although the Disney movie Hocus Pocus has become a cult classic over the years, when it hit theaters back in 1993, it was actually both a critical and commercial failure, losing the company over $16 million. And I, for one, am baffled that people weren't clamoring to buy tickets for this seasonal Halloween adventure, even though it came out almost four months early at the beginning of July. Why does that matter? It's like I told my little cousin at her seventh birthday party. The most terrifying things in life often happen on seemingly ordinary days. And the person most likely to peel your skin off and wear it like pajamas is probably a member of your own family. I was trying to give her the birthday gift of knowledge, but now I don't get invited to Taco Tuesdays anymore. But the release date isn't the only aspect of Hocus Pocus that felt inappropriate for young audiences, with international versions quickly being cut down to remove scenes that show execution, decapitation, false imprisonment, and a beloved family pet after it gets crushed under the tire of a city bus. Because hey, why not? It's the 90s. But frankly, I find this movie even more troubling for its disorganized story, careless incontinuity, and a death march of clearly visible stunt performers who I would drive 100 buses over 1,000 of your cats to not have to sit through again. While it's true that childhood Nick did consider Hocus Pocus to be one of his favorite holiday movies, that's no longer relevant because childhood Nick has been dead for several many years. This Halloween, you're dealing with adult Nicholas and he doesn't have anything nice to say. So check your candy for razor blades and accuse thy neighbor of devil worship because I'm taking you back to where I came from for a whimsical New England folk horror over 300 years in the making on this tricky, treaty, witch defeaty flavored installment of Clip Breakdown of <laughs> Hello television viewers, my name is Nick. Thank you so much for joining me once again on my channel for another a sleeveless installment of Clip Breakdown. This is the playlist where we dive into our favorite movies, TV movies, and other such content here on the web. And we uh break it into pieces like a Kit Kat bar and go over each individual line of this sacred spell and decide whether it's black magic or benevolent enchantment. We'll find out. I wasn't sure if I wanted to cover the original original 1993 movie or go right to the sequel that came out on Disney Plus this year. But this movie, we had the VHS since I was conscious and I always loved it. And uh, boy, I gotta tell you, I don't love it so much anymore. It's not like it's a terrible movie, but I believe the critical reviews were basically correct when they said that it was generic with a hard to grasp story and only a few moments that actually shine. And I don't care if you disagree with me, you're still watching baby. But before before we get into it, make sure you give this video a big thumbs up if you want to see even more clip breakdowns on childhood favorites like this. I know I've been slow to upload in October, but we've got more Halloween content coming, so make sure you click that subscribe button right over here. That way you never miss new videos from me. I upload two new ones every week, so turn on notifications and you'll always be the first to know when I've got a Kit Kat for you to eat at. Also, I've got merch and a Patreon. My newest merch are these enamel pins, which are all under $10 and shipping now. So use the links below if you want to get your hands on some iconic clip breakdown iconography. Now for me and many millennials, this movie was my introduction to Bette Midler, Kathy Najimy, and Sarah Jessica Parker, who play the Sanderson sisters, the head witches of this movie, which begins with a flying POV type shot over colonial Salem, Massachusetts. The the movie was mostly shot in Burbank, although they did two weeks of production in Salem. My good friend Mary lives in Salem and we visited her and took these like witch photos. They really embraced the movie Hocus Pocus. And I saw the house, I saw the town square where the dance is. All of Salem, Massachusetts is like talking about witches and, and you know, kind of embracing that part of the culture. But at this point, it's more so for Hocus Pocus than for the murderous Salem witch trials that ravaged the place. But anyway, let's Let's not look at witch hunting as though it's a symptom of misogyny that allowed people to cause death to their neighbors and loved ones. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna live in a world where witches are real. And for uh, our main side character, Thackeray Binks, he's about to get a real up close look at what real witches can do to his family. <laughs> Good 
morning, colonial teenager. Rise and shine. So while you slept, we were monitoring your home security, which for some reason is a wide open window. And we just saw what looks like cousin It from the Adams family steal your riding lawnmower. Oh, they also snatched your little sister out of bed. So maybe close that mouth up and get the day started, huh? Although I do understand wanting to sleep in. If it was 1693 and my little sister went missing, I would be like that family in The Witch where after their baby gets stolen, they just sort of immediately accept it as a sign of the times. Like, oh no, my baby. I was totally gonna sell her to a farmer in like 12 more years. Oh well, at least I still have my three dirty sheep to make and sell my dirty sheep cheese. The secret ingredient is not washing my hands. The recipe is sort of famous for introducing indigenous people to a new type of foodborne illness. Our main man Thackeray, ugh, that name. He runs out of the house because Emily, his little sister is missing. So he asks his friend, have you seen my missing Emily sister? Elijah. Has to see my sister Emily. Look, she's done for. Not yet. You wake my father, summon the elders, go! <sighs> and don't ye stop at Nordstrom to buy us more matching peasant blouses. It's making our gay little house on the prairie relationship that much more conspicuous. And frankly, I can tell they're not ready to pull off that look until downy wrinkle release gets invented, but that's gonna be a while. One of the scariest parts of this fall season has got to be inflation. Just like everybody, I am making a spooky face at the gas pump, at the grocery store, but that is exactly why I started using Upside, which is also the sponsor of today's video. Upside is an amazing app, I'm earning cash back Back with every single one of those purchases. To get started, all you have to do is download the free Upside app. Next, you can claim an offer for whatever it is you're buying on Upside. I just check in at that business and pay as usual using a debit or credit card, and then I get paid. With Upside, you can earn up to three times more cash than you would with credit card rewards or loyalty programs. And that's real money, honey, that you can send to your bank account, PayPal, or even electronic gift cards for Amazon or other brands. And Upside users are earning more than a million dollars per week. That explains the 4.8 star rating on the App Store. Am I right? Since I've lived two hours from LA, I've been filling up my gas tank a lot more, and Upside is helping me see actual visible cash back on all of those fill-ups, and they even work in the convenience store inside. Download the free Upside app and use code NICKD to get $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. Thanks, Upside, for saving me some cash and making this spooky season a little less so. <laughs> now, are you ready to get scared again? Let's get back into it. When I was a kid watching this scene, I assumed it was crafted with the utmost attention to historical details. But now I see they're just kind of using old English and have severely impacted teeth. A lot of the details are actually a little more modern. Like with Thackeray's 1990s Santa Monica center part and surfs up hair flip that he just did. Also, did it take anyone else like years and years to realize that this character's name was Thackeray with a TH. I thought everyone was saying Zachary, but they just had the same childhood lisp as me. I had to go to speech therapy at school and everything, but I do not think it worked. Sorry, American school system. No amount of flashcards is gonna kill off my baby gay voice that easily. Gonna take a few more years of homophobic microaggressions to really lock that in. But other than that, I'm here. My voice is queer. Get used to it. And allow Allow me to add a third point, since this is only the second clip of the movie and apparently I have all day to talk about this. I love Elijah's Shakespearean stage freeze when Thackeray grabs him by the shoulder. He said, huh, I can't believe Elijah Nobody the Second invented dabbing. Also, it's really good dubbing here. I didn't know unless I had read it that Thackeray's voice, not just as a cat, but here as a human is actually dubbed over because apparently the actor who we see on screen, according to the director's comment, Terry had a voice that sounded too contemporary. Probably like, uh, you wake my father and summon the others and let's get in and out on our way to hang those witches. Speaking of, we jump over to that witch's hut where we see the pink smoke coming up. Thackeray is climbing on windmills, getting through water. He has snot dripping out of his nose and he looks through the window and sees they do in fact have his little sister who seems to be in some sort of trance. Meanwhile, our main witches of the movie, Winifred, played by Bette Midler, Sarah, played by Sarah Jessica Parker, oh yeah, Mary, played by Kathy Najimy. They're making a potion 
And although I had a hard time perceiving this, watching it as a kid, they are in their old age makeup right now. White wigs, mm, more pale skin, kind of looking a little wrinklier. I don't know though, there's something, even if I weren't a child, I mean, I'm not, but even if I weren't a child back then, I would have trouble knowing that this is their old age look. In a minute, they, you know, have a reveal where they're young again. But for me, it's hard because they start the movie, we see them looking old for the first time, and the changes are all just a little too subtle. Either way, they make a potion to suck the life out of the child so that they can be young. And I don't know why, but they're like feeding this poison to Emily and Thackeray's sitting behind some cupboard being like, I'm gonna wait and see how this plays out. Until it's, I guess, a little too late. <laughs> Of a girl. I guess I never noticed that the witches start doing their little Ren fair dance while Emily is slumped over in the chair as a white haired corpse. Like that's a little dark. Also a pretty unceremonious way to kill a little girl in a kids movie, right? Disney was like, meet the Sanderson sisters, a trio of kooky, whimsical witches who kidnap and murder a child within the first 10 minutes of runtime while her brother watches in terror. I guess they kind of soften it by making Emily seem unafraid of the witches since as we find out later, she's under Sarah Sanderson's musical spell or she just genuinely finds this process less terrifying than the prospect of being married off to an abusive of blacksmith at her 10th birthday party. She said, Mama, please suck my soul out. The men folk of this period have set up a timeline to start exploiting women well before puberty begins. Like you really expect her to be like, no, please don't kill me. I was so excited to start using hay stuffed panties to absorb my menstrual blood. I'm so glad I was born in the modern age because if it was any time earlier, I could not. I almost broke down in tears when I couldn't find my special blanket that I like for naps that stays cool. So the idea of like milking a cow, oh, I would riot. And I think that's one of the reasons why the folklore around witches was so prevalent in this time. It's like they're like older spinsters who live alone and haven't married a man, haven't become someone's property, and they use spells to get what they want rather than like shoveling hay. Anyway, Thackeray jumps up and he's like, how dare you have already killed my sister? And they're like, oh, we're gonna cast a spell on you too. And they transfigure him. <laughs> You know, at least this CGI cat was designed by people who actually understand what a cat's face looks like. When Tom Hooper tried to adapt the musical Cats into live action, it was just like Dame Judi Dench as a deep fake wearing a fur coat and Jennifer Hudson with a really runny nose. The effects that make it look like Cat Thackeray Binks is talking was done by shooting real animal actors and then the faces were painted over digitally by the effects house Rhythm and Hughes. They they did make the fangs smaller and less pointed so that kids wouldn't be as scared of the cat. In this scene that started off with child murder and will end in a public execution, Okay. And of course we gotta love that low light CGI of the 1990s. Like yes, you digitally replaced the cat's face with the black abyss of outer space. Those floating features are giving storm drain Pennywise, but sure, less scary, I guess. Also, did you notice that lion's roar that they mixed in with the cat sound effect? This is a trick they use in sound design to subconsciously create a sense of fear in the listener. Because on an evolutionary level, you're like, oh, a Lion. J.J. Abrams used lion's roars during the plane crash at the beginning of Lost. Maybe it looks a little more out of place here because it's like, why did that cat just make two noises? And one of them was from the zoo. Anyway, luckily Elijah has summoned the others. It's crazy how many memories got dredged up for me watching this movie. We used to have a VHS player and a TV in the car. And when we drove to my dad's canoe convention, we watched this movie. Anyway, the witches are getting caught. Witches, uh, there be no witches here, sir. We are just three kindly old spitzer ladies. Uh, spending a quiet evening at home. Oh, okay. Apparently it's nighttime now, everyone. I guess the days were really short in ye old New England because like two seconds ago, Winnie said it was a glorious morning and we were like two numbers into their Sunday brunch drag show. You know those drag shows where they take one child from the audience and kill them on stage? I heard about it from the Girl Defined YouTube channel. It's not gonna lick itself. You said it, Jesusina. Jesus Christina. <laughs> Christina. 
Now we head over to the scene that apparently a lot of the censors had an issue with, where all three of the witches are on the gallows with nooses around their neck. Thackeray and Emily's parents are like, what have you done with our children? Because remember, Thackeray is a cat now, so he can't be like, I'm right here. So their kids are just missing. Even though Emily's not missing, her dead body was under an Afghan. I solved that one for you. And the lives of all the children shall be mine! Did they need to show this hanging in such a graphic detail? Feet swinging? The answer is yes, but only to honor the memory of Walt Disney, who himself was a big fan of lynch mobs and participated in several angry hangings uh, up through the 1950s. I'm just kidding, that's not true, but he was racist. So it might as well. The essence of truth is there. If I were a memoirist, I don't have an end to that sentence. What if though? Let's pretend. The UK release of Hocus Pocus originally cut this part out entirely, so it it went from the witches being at the door with the mob outside and then cut right to what we're about to see with the history teacher finishing the story as they recite it to the class, which completely skips over the part we saw at the beginning of that clip where Winifred curses the children of Salem forever and promises that they'll be back. So, you know, just the inciting incident that's crucial for the audience to understand the plot. No biggie. Hey, maybe that's a good reason when making a children's movie not to have any important dialogue delivered when a character has the noose around their neck because apparently in the UK people don't want their 8 to 14 year olds thinking too much about strangling to death. And that's why you lost the Revolutionary War, King George. Also that weird tactic where you just had lines of troops walking into gunfire like it was a Memorial Day parade. Like we're shooting cannons at you. This is how bowling gets invented. Everything I know about the Revolutionary War I learned from Mel Gibson in The Patriot as well as that kid from small soldiers who gets shot with a musket. I don't know why I'm smiling for it. Poor Thackeray Binks is ignored by his parents because he's just a cat now. And as the history teacher points out, the cat, according to legend, stuck around for centuries and centuries. Oh yeah, the witches were like, you're gonna live forever as a cat, so you always have to live with the guilt. It's like, well, I don't think cats are smart enough to feel guilt, so joke's on you. Anyway, the, this is a smart human cat, so he sticks around the Sanderson house to make sure that nobody ever comes comes in and brings the witches back to life. Black cat warning off any who might make the witches come back to life. <laughs> okay, Mrs. G, that was not cool. You know Kara just survived a home invasion like last month. Why choose her as your jump scare streamer victim? It's okay, Kara. Sorry she just set you back like six hypnosis sessions. Don't think about what they did to your parents. Everyone's still alive. Today's about fun. Can someone play f***ing Monster Mash to cheer Kara up? Jesus. The teacher quickly notes from a very obvious sigh that there is a skeptic in our midst. And it's like, mama, if you're teaching world history, you should also also be a skeptic. You don't really believe this witch thing happened, right? I get if you're teaching local folklore, but mm, I think uh, if there's any history teacher who's like, oh no, there might be real witches. That's like kind of glossing over the real societal problem that led to the witch hunt. Do you like how much candy I have on my table, by the way? I do. Speaking of candy companies. Halloween was invented by the candy companies. It just so <gasps> happens that Halloween, it's the one night of the year where the spirits of the dead can return to earth. Well said, Allison. <laughs> yeah, school is ass, Allison. Fist bumps all around for that sick historical accuracy burn. Because that's how we do it in honors history, where the past comes to life. So as you could tell from his vocal fry, Max is a cool Los Angeles person. Having now lived in both New England and Los Angeles, I can more easily appreciate this East versus West Coast competition that sort of runs through the beginning of the movie. Like I said, you can hear Max's California accent. He has a more pragmatic view on what they should be learning about in history class. He's like, yeah, cool fairy tale that helps sell fun-sized Kit Kats, but why doesn't our textbook acknowledge the existence of Martin Luther King Jr.? If there's one thing New England people love to do, it's whitewash the past. They're like, welcome to the first Thanksgiving where we made green bean casserole. Like, okay, is that all that happened? Sweet. Allison, being the cool, confident, studious person she is, obviously gets a lot of attention, and Max is no exception. In case Jimi Hendrix shows up tonight, here's my number. Max, bad chance. 
Now, I was gay in high school. Actually, I think I still am. But if a classmate came up to me back then and said something vaguely threatening about his fat chance, I would be thinking about it all week. Like, what are we? Not Max, though, because this random character comes in to tell him that he's out of his league with Allison and is never seen again. I don't understand why they couldn't have just, like, worked that character into one of the other bully characters we're about to meet. Although I did read on IMDb that the role of Max was originally offered to Leonardo DiCaprio who declined in order to star in What's Eating Gilbert Grape. So I think maybe they just felt bad that they already hired Leonardo DiCaprio's stand-in. So they like threw him that featured extra spot. Regardless, Max is really swinging big by like flirting in front of the whole class. And why is their teacher just letting it happen? Is she just like stupid for streamers and that's all she has room for? If some student got up in the middle of my class discussion to hit on another student, I would pull the fire alarm. Because because to me, that feels less illegal than what he's doing. Don't put girls on the spot like that with your number. I would be humiliated. Allison plays it cool though. She wasn't humiliated and uh, she's like trick or treat after school and gives him back the number. So I guess she wasn't so impressed by that anyway. Also, we meet some of the secondary antagonists. These are all portions that were shot in Salem, Mass. And two of the bullies uh, named Ernie or Ice, as well as Jay, they steal his shoes. They're like, oh, Hollywood, what's up? It's like, why do you sound like Hollywood though? Anyway, I never quite noticed how inconsequential these bully characters are to the larger plot other than taking his shoes away. And uh, when he gets back to his room, he's talking to himself about Allison. And that's when we meet his stupid, annoying sister, Danny, played by Thora Birch. And since Max's parents have like an adult only Halloween party to attend, which like gross parents don't tell us about your swinging sex parties he's embarrassingly forced to take Danny trick-or-treating and he gets further made fun of by the like bullies of the school they take his candy these brother sister dynamics when they're like arguing at the beginning I'm like I don't care none of this is witchcraft I want to go home now Uh, Danny, your emotions are valid, but can we maybe find some way of processing them without diving headfirst into a stack of soft pumpkin and open flame? Because she looks dangerously close to catching a blaze with that nylon witch's hat and hair that someone tried their best with. One wrong move and it's gonna be just like Taylor Swift sang about in her reputation era. They're burning all the witches even if you aren't one. Like, ugh, that line. I'm a Swifty for life, but can we, uh, can we we think about what we're saying here? They're burning all the witches even if you aren't one? What? I know Taylor likes to handwrite her lyrics, but I don't know, maybe start using erasable pen. Cause uh, some simple editing probably could have made that a little bit more grammatically correct. The subject of the sentence just switches in the middle from they, the witches, to you, the not witches. It annoys me in a fun way how many song lyrics make absolutely no sense if you take them out of the context of a melody. My friends, Joe and Luis and I, I love coming up with examples for that and then like trying to fix them to be like, what would make sense here? The classic one being Katy Perry, never really over. She's like, I can't even go on the internet without even checking your name. Why are you saying even twice? Oh, and I have an example. We talked about this one. I was saying this is a line by Taylor Swift that makes no sense. And Luis was trying to help come up with the correction. Burning out the witches even if they're not one. Which I think works better, but what I, what I would do if I were Taylor Swift. They'll burn you like a witch even if you aren't one. <laughs> Lost my confidence at the end there, but you get it. They, I mean, like, make it make sense. So Max and Danny have a little tender moment of apology where he apologizes for being mad and getting all, you know, embarrassed in front of his friends. And he realizes that this move isn't super easy for Danny either. And in this way, I am glad we have the moment. It helps build the relationship between these two characters so that we already establish how much they care about one another. Mm, that through line of wanting to protect Danny and be a good big brother really drives a lot of 
of the action that he takes in this movie. But I gotta say, the action in this movie in general is not only generic, but also not that cinematic. They're like, let's go to a house. Let's light a candle. Now let's run away for 90 minutes. But anyway, they're friends again, they're siblings again, and they see a big old house. And they're like, this is gonna have the rich full-size candy bar type of stuff. And then of course, when they get inside, this is Allison's fancy party. Of course, Danny can't help but be super embarrassing and annoying. I couldn't wear anything like that because I don't have any, what do you call them, Max? Yabos? <laughs> Max likes her yabos. In fact, he loves them. Uh, Danny, absolutely no one at this weirdly elegant Halloween party has asked for an update on your breast development. So go ahead and eat your lollipop that keeps changing in every shot because you're smart enough to know when to shut the f up. And Max, I don't even know where to begin with the absolutely ludicrous word you reportedly use on poor Allison's breasts. Who has ever referred to that part of the body as Yabos? If anything, that's a nickname for Fred Flintstone's cheeks. Max is just in his bedroom on that drum set playing a jazz rhythm like, Allison's Yabos, I gotta have those. Abba dabba dabba, abbo nipple. I'm like, uh, okay. Maybe we don't need to come up with new words for boobs. Just say boob. Or better yet, Yet say tits, sensual tits, sensual Halloween tits. You can have your own if you put on my lapel pin on your yabos. <laughs> okay, Allison is like really into witches. It's like, yeah, we got that because you defended like the art of Halloween this morning in class. You mean the Sanderson sisters? My mom used to run the museum. There's a museum about it? Why don't we go to this old Sanderson house? My friends at school told me all about that place. It's weird. Oh, so you were just pretending not to know about the museum when Allison mentioned it a minute ago. More sketchy mind games from Danny, everyone. Grab a plate. She is so manipulative and precocious and witty and she gets to have a cool adventure and she has chocolate dissolving in her mouth. Okay, I'm hearing a lot of jealousy in my voice. I think I've been holding on to it since childhood. I didn't realize how much I want to be her. So she better give me that chocolate lollipop pop and then I'm gonna throw her in the river. No, sorry, that's not who I really am, except for on Halloween, so, you know, just don't let your kid trick or treat near a river. I, as a kid, did want to be Danny, and I do, because that chocolate lollipop of a witch looks so good. I love chocolate lollipops, even though they're just chocolate with a stick. Sometimes they have colorful aspects of them. Okay, here's my other problem. Like, this whole movie gets kickstarted because I feel like Max has this kind of random idea to go visit the Sanderson sister house, which was later turned into a museum. Like, it comes out of nowhere for him to be like, let's go see this old place. Because, like, how is, I get that he's trying to impress Allison. I don't think that's a good enough reason because, like, uh, she's already been there. Her mom used to work there. So I wish maybe if they could have intertwined some conflict from the bullies or if, like, Allison was enamored with this piece of jewelry, a cursed pendant that used to be there. And now it's just locked up and no one would ever notice if it's gone. And he's like, I can get it for you. Like, something to really impress her. Or, like, the bullies were like, oh, you're not brave enough to find the old Sanderson sister's diaphragm. And so he goes and finds it and whatever. Like there, if there was a better reason than to just be like, let's check it out. But anyway, the kids go to the museum and encounter a few of the Sanderson sisters' sacred objects that the museum was showing off, such as the Book of the Dead, which is like a leather bound book bound in human skin and the black flame candle, which apparently it would bring back the witches if a virgin lit the candle on Halloween night. And I'm just thinking like, if this museum was open for years, wouldn't someone have lit the candle on Halloween night eventually, just out of curiosity? I think so. Anyway, Max is showing off. Legend says that on a full moon, it will raise the spirits of the dead when lit by a virgin on Halloween night. You do the honors? No, thanks. Allison's like, damn, all it takes is wearing a few cream-colored sweaters and this whole town presumes to know how many people I've slept with. Max, you saw she's old Massachusetts money with a grand staircase. Her Halloween costume had a corset and she left the house without telling her parents. That's rich kid privilege. Why do you just assume she's a virgin? You don't think she could have possibly experimented with some boyfriend at summer camp where like the dressage horses outnumber the counselors. Also shout out to all of the parents, including mine who had to explain to their eight year olds what it means to be a virgin in a way that they could understand. Since for some reason this kid's movie decide to make it a key aspect of the plot that simply won't stop coming up. A virgin. 
lit the candle. And he's a virgin. When I knew some airhead virgin might light that candle. For a virgin to light a candle. Are you a virgin? Officer, he's in high school. So if you could please specify whether that includes virginity and mouth virginity. Kids care about those details. It matters. Max, sweetie, the, the police officer's gonna list out some body parts and you just have to let him know whether or not you've been in it. That way we can tell how angry you made the devil, okay? See, like, what is this with virginity? Mm-mm. Too much of that. They could have easily made it like a child needs to do it or like a, an innocent youth, you know, then it would have been fine. But the, the virgin thing is not only mentioned too much, it's like, I mean, it would be so normal for someone Max's age to be a virgin, but everyone, the adults, the kid, even his eight-year-old sister is like, a virgin? It's like, girl, why are you not a virgin? Anyway, let's move on. Max lights the black flame candle and almost immediately the shit hits the fan. This is maybe one of the more exciting parts of practical effects. The floorboards start moving and lights come up underneath and we hear the witches flying overhead. This part gave me nightmares. When the witches burst into the room and Danny and Allison like hide behind the doors. Oh, it was like such a close call as a kid that I had this dream where me and my sisters were in this motor home camping in Maine where we used to go. It was, but then it turned out it was the Sanderson sisters trailer home. And so I hid under the comforter of their bed while they were looking around for our, for us. And it was really scary. And that's why I keep burning down all those trailer parks. It's not my fault. So the witches discover Danny first and they're like descending upon her being like, oh, did you light the candle? And they're clearly about to come at her with their, their big spoon of potion and suck her life out. But that's when Max jumps to her defense and a full-on paranormal melee ensues. These witches like shoot fire at him and he's like sliding up the walls. Again, cool effects, but the stunt work, mm, maybe a little messy. You leave my brother alone! I think it's official. Hocus Pocus is my favorite Disney movie that depicts children being electrocuted. In close second is the Pixar animated short, Duncan Rewires a Doorbell. <laughs> Poor Duncan, he dies instantly. I'm talking about death a lot this episode. Why? Halloween. <laughs> and the candy. I love that candy. So yeah, fun how he's sliding up the wall. But when I look screen left, I have some questions regarding Sarah Sanderson's performance. Specifically, who the f is that lady playing her? We're getting a full on view of a stunt double right now. And unfortunately, this is not the only part of the movie where specifically Sarah Jessica Parker's double is right on screen. It's very obvious. I mean, they have completely different faces. Only one of which is pulling off the red lip and smoky eye combo. That's a very specific and bold makeup combination. And I guess today we learned that it can look very different depending on the person. Now, Max narrowly escapes with his sister and friend because he uses the fact that the witches don't know anything about modern times to their advantage. Even though the witches like use anachronistic dialogue immediately, they're like, oh, let me just check out the net. Even though they're like, what is this weird thing? And it's like a, a cloud. It's like, you had those back then, you had those. Anyway. Max uses the lighter to set off the sprinklers. I'm like, why did they leave the water running at this abandoned building? Why did they also abandon the museum and like leave everything from the artifacts? to the like racist cherry candy on the counter just to collect dust. So anyway, he causes the rain to come and makes his escape and the uh, they grab the book as well. I don't know why they grabbed the book. I would have been so terrified that it just ran, but oh, you know why? Because while Max is trying to escape, Binks comes out of the woodwork, Thackeray, and speaks to him. Apparently, Binks couldn't speak as a, hu as a cat until the Sanderson sisters came back. That's never explained. Seems like a plot hole to me, but on the internet, they'll say, no, no, it makes sense. Binks is like, get the book and run. So he knows they need the book to like eventually defeat these witches who after leaving the house are sort of shocked by all of the modern changes of the world. <gasps> this is a black river. <laughs> <laughs> it's firm. Ew, 
It's firm as stone. That's another line that always brings back memories because as kids, me and my sisters were quoting that all the time. Tis firm, tis firm as stone. In fact, I still say that like once a week, every time I discover a new goiter. There's a reason I don't show you the backside of my neck. It looks like I tried to swallow a tube of tennis balls. Their kids, after getting over the shock that Binks can talk to them in human voice and get his advice that they need to go to hallowed ground, AKA a graveyard where the witches cannot step foot. See something like that, I accept as like a detail that we're learning through expositional dialogue about the witches. But then there are other like new things about witch lore that are just thrown in or like assumed to be true. And it's it's not always clear. Like I'm, I just wish they could have like cleaned up this draft of the script a little more, but I know that the movie went through crazy rewrites in order to get greenlit. Like the Allison and Max characters were originally younger children. They aged them up to teenagers and lots of other moves to try to make this less scary. I still found this movie scary as a kid though. There were several parts that have terrified me. That's not really saying much though. I was an anxious child. Not anymore though, perfection. So Binks decides to show them the grave of Billy Butcherson. I don't know why he does this. <laughs> Billy Butcherson was Winifred's lover. She poisoned him and sewed his mouth shut with a dull needle but she found him sporting with her sister, Sarah. He was sporting with her sister? I would have poisoned him too. That's the ultimate betrayal. I assume sporting is like colonial speak for eating ass. Hold on, I'll call my local librarian to confirm. Hi, Judith. It's Nick again. Hey, did they call 1600s analingus sporting? And if so, was it a team sport? And how many players on each side? It, it's for a project. Meanwhile, the cat's computer face still seems to be hovering weirdly, like the guilt-stricken religious person at a sex party. Wow, I'm sorry. I forgot this was a kid's movie. It would have been way more appropriate for me to say costume party, where group sex is happening in the back room. Oops. Forgot I'm still on speakerphone. Judith? No, I wasn't inviting you to. Just focus on the ass eating thing. Or sporting, as they used to call it. Winifred is absolutely livid that these kids have stolen her beloved book. Uh, I do like that the book has an eyeball that opens and uh, sort of becomes a character in its own right. So they're now going around Salem trying to find the kids. They're in the graveyard trying to destroy the book, but it's protected by magic. And I don't know, who cares? That's the other thing about this movie. Like the book becomes the main like reason that the witches are chasing them. Okay, but what happened to the candle? Never becomes important again. So like there just seem to be all of these disjointed elements. Yes, the bullies were there and they come back, but they didn't have anything to do with motivating the inciting incident. There was no motivating reason behind him wanting to go to the place. Even if he could have been like a mystery hunter or trying to, for some reason, disprove that witches are real. So he's like, oh, I'm gonna light that black flame candle. And when nothing happens, the whole town will have to see that they're a bunch of New England idiots. But we don't even get something like that. But hold on to your wigs, Sanderson sisters, because they fly over the graveyard. I guess that's a pretty strong loophole. Like they can't set foot on hallowed ground. Doesn't matter if they can fly on their broom. Anyway, uh, Winifred resurrects her ex-boyfriend, Billy, who breaks out of his coffin. He's a zombie with like a stone shut in mouth and obviously that terrifies the kids who run off and hide in the sewer where Binks likes to hunt rats. Meanwhile, the Sanderson sisters, unable to get to them through the graveyard, get on a bus that happens to come by. We desire children. <laughs> Hey, that may take me a couple of tries, but I don't think that'd be a problem. Oh. There's one passenger on the back of that bus like, well, I would just like to get to my night shift at the hospital, but I guess those kids will just have to wait for their cancer meds. While my bus driver threatens a group of women with his low sperm count. Oh, I definitely forgot to mention it, but at, back at the Sanderson house, Winnie mentions that they need to find that book along with some child victims, because if they don't start sucking the life out of kids, they're gonna be dead by morning, by sunrise. So this introduces the concept that like they die at sunrise, although I'm confused. Like in the beginning of the movie, back in the 1600s, they were old and it seemed like the desire to be youthful again was based on vanity. It doesn't, or maybe it could have shown them being like so close to death because they're that old. But now it's like, what are we supposed to believe that you don't have enough life force left to make it past daylight? When, how young do they need to be? Like babies to make, and how many days does that buy them? I'm not saying 
saying which sunlight logic needs to make perfect sense, but it would be nice to know where these rules are coming from. And you know, the kids have this book. They could do it really unexpositionally where the kids are like reading this book and it's like all about witches. They're allergic to water. They uh, kill children. They wear circular blush and heart-shaped lipstick. These are all fun things to know. So uh, the bus driver is really groping some of his passengers. And when the kids are coming up through the sewer, Binks gets hit by the bus. This part terrified me. Not because of the bus crash, but like they show a simulated cat corpse with like a tire track through it. That's a lot. That was also cut from the UK version. Oh my God. It's all my fault. Uh, where did Disney get that CT scan of my lung back when I smoked menthols? Oh, it must have been one of those extra forms I signed when I got my kidney stones removed at Epcot. I originally wanted to get married there, but traditionally speaking, I need to stop ruining all my relationships first. But just like I told my last boyfriend, it's hard for me to improve myself because I'm already flawless. And I can't say I'm sorry because I've never done anything wrong in my life. So I don't know what you want me to do. Anyway, Danny is like crying over this cat she just just met until he starts inflating back to life. And that's how we know he's immortal. The witches are now walking around Salem, confused by all of the obvious costumes. I'm like, even just because you're from the past, you can tell when a mask is a mask, especially if you're a witch and you've seen the real devil, just saying. Anyway, they, I don't know why they think Salem is suddenly like the hub of openly walking demons, but they think that. And then they go to one of these houses and a uh, man dressed as the devil comes out and they think it's obviously the real devil. They're like, master. And it's just some kind of, you know, couch potato guy and his couch potato wife, which interestingly, these people are played by Gary Marshall who directed Valentine's Day and God, what was that other awful one we watched? New Year's Eve. And his wife is played by his real life sister, something else Marshall, which is always weird. Meanwhile, the kids go to the cops with the least credible version of this story that they could think of. We know by now that when it comes to talking to the police, you never tell them the truth. Get out. Come on, Danny. Take that cat with you. What's so funny, Eddie? Kids pulling my chain. Thought I was a real cop. Oh, Eddie, impersonating a cop to deceive the vulnerable. What a fun Halloween prank. And also the first troubling behavior of several infamous child predators and serial killers. I hope you're not escalating, but good Lord. The police officers in Salem really do have a witch on their arm. And I'm like, we love doing this witches flying in front of the moon thing when it was genocide. The witch hunts were genocide against mostly women, 80% women. Anyway, they only try to tell this one cop who thinks they're telling a prank and scares them off. But I mean, Max, Danny, and Allison are sort of to blame, running around and rambling about the, the candle, the book, the spells, the curse. Girl, stop moving your mouth like this is the Lion Witch in the wardrobe. Just tell them that there are three adults trying to hurt you. That should raise some alarms, right? Then maybe that your genuine fear will be convincing. Anyway, let's check in with Master. This part always confused me as a child because obviously the Sanderson sisters think he's the real devil. So he's like, come on in. But I was confused because he's acting like he knows them. Although he really just sees like, oh, they're dressed as the famous witches from our town's folklore. And I'm like, so then uh, I guess I was too young and innocent to understand why a gentleman would invite three other ladies who showed up at his doorstep into the house. But you know, they're trying to have a horny Halloween hookup, I think, the, the devil and his wife. But actually the wife starts to get real impatient when she sees Sarah dancing with him. Get out Wooden face. Shove it, Satan. Thou should not speak to master in such a manner. Mama, the only master anyone's speaking to right now is the master staircase. We can see in the mirror, there's no one in front of you. I didn't mention it. This movie was directed by Kenny Ortega, who did High School Musical, most notably. And it kind of feels like he just handed all of these scenes over to his intern and was like, come get me when there's a musical number in an auditorium to direct. I'll be in my trailer practicing windmill arms. Oh, uh, 
to escalate the conflict for the witches who they left their brooms leaned up against the fence. I don't know why you wouldn't just bring them inside with you. They're brooms, not Buicks. And some kids took them and you hear them flying away. And like those kids definitely plummeted to their death, but okay. Meanwhile, the kids, after getting no help from the cops, big surprise, decide to go see their parents at the like all adult Halloween party that apparently is happening in Salem Town Hall. I have a picture right in front of this place because we went on like the Salem walking tour, which was not so much a tour of Hocus Pocus filming locations. And it was more like, this is where young Johnny was hanged for stealing a scrap of leather. I was like, okay, I can get into that. The adults in this town really go all out for Halloween. They're wildin'. I'm gonna look for mom. But he is too intense for Ugh, not open shooter Sally firing off blanks inside a government building. She said, support the NRA. Wow. Wasn't someone going to circulate a flyer about how to choose costumes that won't cause the masses to freak out? We don't want a repeat of last year where people flooded the streets after hearing a rumor that Michael Jackson was in town, when in reality, it was just the one black guy who lives here dressed as a werewolf. Finally, Max finds his dad, who is no help. They're like, like, have you ever met your kid? If he seems genuinely panicked, why are you like, oh, what's wrong? Oh my goodness, who must this charming young blood donor be? Dad! Stop sexualizing my underage classmate for a second and listen to my story about the magic candle. Like you two are straight up Harry Potter and the parents with no boundaries right now. Allison, sweetie, just call in a bomb threat to get everyone out of here or scream that you've been jabbed with a hypodermic needle. That was super trendy for a period of time during the 90s. Of course, the mom is talking to Danny and she's like, how much candy have you had? It's like, do you think candy makes people hallucinate witches? Be real, mom. Your daughter's scared. She's a child. If she's saying witches are chasing her, then maybe possibly some people dressed as witches are chasing her. And they handle this the wrong. I'm, I'm getting mad. <laughs> Anyway, Max gets on stage and he's trying to warn everybody that the Sanderson sisters are back from the dead. And I'm like, bro, you're acting like this is the pre-show for a Universal Studios attraction. Like you gotta make it more believable if you want people to act. Because the spotlight finds the Sanderson sisters and everyone's like, oh, they're dressed so realistic. Even though we've never seen them in real life. And everybody is like into it because Bette Midler, I, I, or Winifred Sanderson, starts to perform a song this is easily one of the most watchable parts of the movie. They adapted some of the lyrics and it's it's very catchy. Uh, you winnie wish winnie Fred, but the title of The Worst Witch obviously goes to Weird British Mildred from the BBC series The Worst Witch. Ugh, those opening credits just instantly brought my childhood depression back out of remission. Such miserable looking green screen girls. And imagine how embarrassed Europe must be that they killed like 64,000 women in their witch trials. Yet there are still hordes of hovering broomstick girls flying above the fields of Ireland. Uh, looks like you missed a few Europe and they're the most annoying ones. So I don't know if you wanna set those gallows back up or maybe you can just fire an anti-aircraft missile at a Quidditch game. What? I thought they were children of the devil. We're supposed to just let them fly through restricted airspaces? Not on my watch. Your wretched riddle lives have all been cast and if all the witches working, I'm the worst. Oh, by the way, we're going to be watching Hocus Pocus 2 on my Patreon for an exclusive Patreon only virtual watch party. So if you're not already a member, make sure you sign up. It'll be uh, available to watch after as an archived version if this is in the future. So check it out. I had to look up the lyrics for this part. Since when does casting these spells require a bunch of gibberish? I find this movie's use of incantations to be a little confusing. Sometimes it's a rhyming poem. Sometimes it's just regular talking. And now it's full on alphaba from Wicked with the Elika Nama Nama Nachu Machu Melika Naman. And the same still goes for their sacred mystical objects. First it's a unique candle, then it's an interesting book. Like we get it Sanderson sisters, you shop at Urban Outfitters. But maybe we can combine some of these 
these story elements to make it feel like a little less scattered. Uh, for example, why the black flame candle? Can't we have had the book had the spell that brought them back or the book needs to be on the sacred altar in order for the spell to work that sends them back? You know, like when it, it could be anything, it's all nonsense. Then it wouldn't be like, oh, now the sunlight is what sends them back. Like that feels like a third thing. Plus, like I said, this is the part where the action feels really passive to me on the part of the main protagonists, Max, Alice, and Danny. They're just running from the ladies now because they have the book that they want. I'm like, well, what is the plan? Just to run forever with the book? Like, why can't there be some sort of solution of like the only way to deactivate the book is to read it backwards while hanging on the monkey bars? You know, like give them a task to do. Oh, like maybe there's some sort of historical artifact that Allison's mom brought back from her time as a museum curator that was briefly mentioned. So they need to go find it in the storage facility of the high school where they end up. These would feel more connected to me. It's like, we always know where they're going to do and why, but here it's just like, oh, now they're at this place. Now they're at that place. Speaking of now they're at that place, the kids end up at the high school, real loose security at these buildings. And Max is on the mm, PA system, luring the Sanderson sisters towards their voice because they don't know what a PA system is, even though they do know the words to I put a spell on you. Like, how do you not know about speakers, but you know, screaming Jay Hawkins, doesn't matter. My favorite actor in this, by the way, is Vanessa Shaw, who plays Allison. This was the first movie I ever saw her in, but my favorite movie that I ever saw her in was the 2006 remake of The Hills Have Eyes, where she's shot in the head at point blank range. Don't know why I'm smiling for that either. I just love Halloween and gun violence. Just kidding, I don't. So this is all a ruse. The kids have lured Winnie and sisters into the pottery kiln and sizzle, sizzle, drizzle, drizzle. It's time to burn these girls to death. <laughs> Damn, how are these kids casually watching three people burn alive the same way I watch my Stouffer's mac and cheese in the microwave? Now this part, the burning the witches, seems very out of nowhere to me. Nobody told them that that would work. Did they get the idea from the book, like burning them would help? Why do even the witches in the kiln scream as though they think they're dying? Wouldn't they know it's gonna be okay? Because they don't seem surprised when they just turn into green smoke and come back later. Couldn't we have seen that somehow brought up at the beginning, like the colonial people of the 1600 tried to burn them at the stake, but they used a spell to be like, we can't catch on fire or whatever. Like, you know, there's no precedence for the fire thing. And these kids just run around thinking they did it. They're running through the streets of Salem, although this is uh, now Burbank. And they, it's a red herring. They think they've solved the problem, but there's a twist. I've wanted to do that for 300 years <laughs> since they took Emily. You really miss her, don't you? Who, his eight-year-old sister that he saw die right in front of him? Yeah, I know, it's so weird how he's still holding on to that. Then again, this was back in the 90s before we had some of the newer treatments for mental illness that we could employ today, such as watching the music video to Shake It Off by Taylor Swift. Works like a charm. I'm no longer a danger to others. In fact, let's pull that up right now just to be safe. <laughs> See, now instead of feeling sad, I just feel super f***ing annoyed. The hella good hair. <laughs> Sorry, I just had a night terror. And it's Taylor's fault. So we saw the witches turn to green smoke and fly into the atmosphere. And then I guess it just like, the smoke went back down the chimney. Like you see how it's not a bad movie from a production standpoint, but like these things don't make sense. <laughs> and they're never explained. It would have taken a little more effort to, to think of a way to make it make sense or put it into the folklore. All these history teachers talking about witches, they couldn't have mentioned what happens when you burn one. Anyway, when the witches do escape, they run into um, Ernie, Ice, and Jay, who call them ugly, and that sets them off. So they're the new kidnap victims of the world. They lock these kids in like swinging cages, which to me is terrifying. These, these kids would be terrified, but I also don't know how we got from two people sitting outside and then the three witches brought them across town to some old house. Like, did they pick them up and carry them? It doesn't matter. Back at home, Allison and Max think 
that the witches are defeated and now they want to use the magic book to find a way to help free Binks from his eternal cat prison. Oh, they also read how one sure way to protect themselves from witches is to sit in a circle of salt. So before Allison and him walk home, she's like, let's bring some salt just in case. And then they open the book, which shoots a giant beacon of light out of the house and calls to the Sanderson sisters who were just about to give up, waiting for sunrise to come and take them away. But after Winnie sees that light, she's like, we're good again. And they, they grab their not brooms, cause they lost the brooms, but they look in the museum broom closet and find like a broom, a mop, and our favorite, this is probably one of the funnier parts of the movie too, which is not enough to carry it, but still, I love Mary. Ooh, Kathy and Jimmy said she based her character on a bloodhound who was always looking for food, which I'm like, oh, I get it. That's, that's a smart acting move, I see it. Uh, it says form a circle of salt to protect from zombies, witches, and old boyfriends. Yeah, and what about new boyfriends? Hmm, I actually don't think it has instructions for new boyfriends. So I assume we just have to salt your penis until a UTI forms. Should we get kosher salt? I heard Allison's parents complaining about how Jewish your family was, sorry. Anyway, they're off while the race, the witches are racing on their broomsticks and vacuum. <laughs> You know what, at least a vacuum is a little bit wider and more comfortable to sit on. With all these skinny little broomsticks and mop handles, the Sanderson sisters might as well be flattening their pubic mounds with a rolling pin like a ball of cookie dough. Why go through all the trouble of draining children of their life force so you have a young looking face if the is still gonna be more bruised and battered than on the final day of Fleet Week. Oh, for those who don't know, Fleet Week is um, like a day in San Diego or other port cities when we get to celebrate the power, the purpose, and the people of America's Navy by letting them come on land and enter our gay bars to give us pubic lice or me, and I graciously accept. One time in New York during Fleet Week, a Norwegian sailor took me on his boat, even though it wasn't allowed. They almost made me walk the plank, but luckily I'm a very good dancer. <laughs> Don't make me drown. Don't drown me in the river. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, the witches come to the house. They break into the top of Max's room and steal Danny. Now that they know where the book is, they grab the book, they grab Danny. And that while they're making more potion, Sarah uses her magical song to lure the children of the town who are all unsupervised because the parents are all stuck at the dance. That song that Winifred performed was also a spell that would make the parents dance until they die. So they're all tied up at the, at the party. And Sarah's giving us this little song. Okay, it looks like Kenny Ortega didn't have time to choreograph anything for this song. He just has SJP hanging from a string while he calls up, now stretch your arms out, touch yourself sensually, now off the broom, make it look like you're off the broom. We get it. She's the promiscuous one. But sir, this is the actress who played Annie on Broadway. Some respect. You can't make little orphan Annie push her boobs together like that. Sarah, don't listen to him. The network wants to go in the opposite direction, okay? That's right. We want you to manually separate your boobs. Cup one in each hand and don't let them ever touch. Great. Something's weird about Sarah coming down on this broomstick. <laughs> Oopsies, once again, we got the Walmart great value version of Sarah Sanderson's face on screen. Like, who is that? Next time, before we hoist anyone up on these mechanical brooms, can we just double check to make sure it's an A-list actress and not the weird blonde lady from craft services who loves a velvet robe? Like, we get it, Colleen. You behave strangely at work and probably on the weekends. That's fine. So now there are all these town's children walking towards the Sanderson's house. And meanwhile, Danny He's tied to a chair. Binks is trapped in a bag over a flame. And she's basically, I don't know why they couldn't use the same spell to like subdue Danny that they did with Emily at the beginning, but she really steps in it by being like, doesn't matter how many children's a d you suck. <laughs> ah, why did I say that? She said, it doesn't matter. 
<laughs> because you're um, evil and old and you sold your soul to the devil, you'll always be ugly. And that really makes what's her name mad. She's like, okay, now I'm just gonna kill you, Winifred says. Luckily, uh, Max comes to the rescue right in time and he's like, I have the knowledge of power. There's something I know that you don't. Daylight savings time. Which on its face seems clever. You know, the sun comes up and, and the witches all think that they're dying. And I get it, like daylight savings time is a new invention that the Sandersons wouldn't have been aware of and therefore the sun would have come up sooner than they were planning. But like, ha they didn't have clocks in the 1600s. They didn't know sunset times. So wouldn't the Sanderson sisters just be judging how soon sunlight is coming based on the, the height of the sun in the sky? Like they wouldn't be worried about uh, time. They would just be sensing it. I don't know. I officially hate this movie. I'm sorry. I really thought I was gonna enjoy it because I did as a kid, but it took me like three weeks to get through like planning this video out because, oh, depressing. I did buy a lot of chocolate lollipops though. So it had good inspo there. All right, so. Here's where we're at. The Sanderson sisters have Danny, but not the book. So they're trying to use Danny to get the book. Max goes with Allison to the graveyard again, where that's where they're gonna like plan to do this showdown with the witches, because I guess they'll be safer on hollow ground. See how all over the place this is? Like, it's like two objects changing hands a million times. And I don't, you know, as, even as an adult, I'm like, I don't follow. I get it though, like this is the climax. And as soon as Max enters the graveyard, he gets apprehended by Billy Butcherson, the zombie. And Winifred is like, Billy, bring him to me. But he doesn't like her anymore because he got murdered by her. Don't, don't come along now. <laughs> Okay, good plan, Billy. You start clearing those moths out of your mouth cavity and I'll start scooping the maggots out of your ass. I insist. I know it's not strictly necessary for this adventure, but I'm still really good at it because I used to be the personal assistant to Pete Davidson. Oh yeah. I don't know why I have to be mean to him sometimes, but he's got a maggot. This mouth gag, by the way, is a practical effect. Those are live moths that fly out of Billy's mouth, which is really cool because they did it with a mouth, like latex pocket that went in his mouth with a little hole so he could blow air through it. And then an animal trainer would put live moths in with the dust using tweezers. And then the makeup artist would glue the strings back together. And then he, they could say action and he would poof, cough out the flying moth, which I just think is so cool. It's similar to what they did in in the movie Candyman, where the guy had like bees crawling out of his mouth and they made a similar device. That's like one of those things where they're like, no animals were harmed in the making of this film. And it's like, really? You're telling me not one single moth died on the job? Would you even know who would report it? Does anyone care about the insect lives? Cause their lifespan is so short. Not like a golden retriever. So at this point they realize Billy is a good guy. He's on their side. So he, you know, helps protect Danny. They draw a circle of salt around him. But then Winnie goes and flies at him and knocks off his head. However, this is another part, the like head being knocked off and any part where Billy is wandering around headless that they cut out of the UK version of this, they did not give a f whether people understood this movie in the UK because the character is credited as headless Billy Butcherson. And in the UK, they never saw him once be headless until several audiences complained and they had to kind of restore some of this missing information. So now if you watch it in the UK, they just remove the actual swinging legs and it shows just the colonial people looking away when they're hanged. Don't see the crushed body of the cat, which I would have appreciated as a kid. I hated that part. And you still don't see any of the headless parts, but I'm like, who cares about the headless part? I want to see less white haired corpse children in the opening scene, but whatever. Danny is such an idiot and I'm jealous of her because I loved like the idea of being kidnapped as a kid. Ah! I don't know why I have to admit these things, but she gets out of the salt circle to help Billy get his head back on. And I'm like, sis, he's already dead. Do you think it matters? He was trying to protect you and you're climbing out of the one salty circle that's supposed to save you. Mm. Oh, and of course that means Winifred swoops down and grabs her. Because Winnie didn't have the potion recipe, cause she didn't have the book, they only had a tiny bit of potion left in that cauldron from 300 years ago, which they don't show a close up of. I'm like, was it fossilized liquid? Either way, they scoop the last potion out there. They're like, we have enough for one child. And that vial gets dropped somehow and Max catches it. And then they have this standoff where she, she's like, give me the vial or the child dies. And he's like, I'll smash it. And she's like, well then I'll break your little sister's neck. She doesn't say that, but that's what I hope would have happened. Happened. <laughs> 
And then, you know, I think this is a bit of clever writing. You know, Max doesn't have many choices. He's got the potion and she's gonna give it to the sister, so he does this instead. Put her down or I'll smash it! I'll smash it and she dies! Well, Max, I hope that tasted as good as it looked because you definitely have throat cancer now. Yes, it's dark magic, but it's still comprised of chemical elements, specifically radium and uranium. So by the time Thanksgiving rolls around, he's gonna have bones that feel like memory foam. You'll be able to leave your handprint in the back of his skull plate. What? It's Halloween. Let's get a little gruesome. Talk about carcinogens. It's not that weird. Remember when I talked about scooping maggots out of someone's that was weird. Oh, maggot infested zombie butt, maggot infested zombie butt, maggot infested zombie butt. That's the new monster mash. It was a maggot infested zombie butt. So now that Max drank the potion, he's like, well, the gig is up, sis. You can suck my teenage soul out. And that's all you got. That's your only option. And she's like, fine. Did I forget to mention that the way they tricked the daylight savings time thing was like, they turned on the headlights of the car and that was enough to trick the kid. I'm like, what kind of headlights do you have that would be anywhere near looking like the sun? I guess they're from the old times. They don't have electricity. I get it, I get it, I get it, but I don't like it. Max gets lifted up on a broom. There's like all these people fighting him and Allison and Danny are trying to help by like grabbing the uh, plug to the vacuum cleaner that Mary is riding. So, you know, it's a fun little showdown here on the sound stage made to look like a, a graveyard. What I don't understand is how Winnie gets a good sip of Max's life force out of him right as the sun is coming up. And I mean, like how many years of his life did that take? off because it only took two sips for Emily to die. It would be cool if he got like a white streak in his hair. That would be fun. But it seems like just in time, the sun comes all the way up and that causes Winifred to turn into a stone statue. And then the other two witches burst into a very fun, pretty glittery explosion that matches their costumes. So that's fun. Branding. <laughs> me when a guy says that he's into hard rock. And yeah, I know he was talking about the type of music, but I'm not gonna listen to Aerosmith. What next? Visit a cigar store? Get a tattoo that's just a list of my wife and kids names? Watch an episode of Top Gear? Ugh! No thanks, I'll just sing a high note until my entire body calcifies. But like Winifred, I want someone to apply blush and lipstick to my stone chiseled features. I know they never mentioned a single thing in this movie about the sunlight turning the Sanderson witches into stone statues. And I mean, I guess that wouldn't need an explanation if it happened to all three of them, but it, it only was Winifred. The other two just burst. I'm guessing it was too expensive to build one of these custom statues for all of three of the actresses because I read that they had to make six identical versions for Bette Midler. None of them really look like her, by the way. I mean, come on. That's clearly the exhumed corpse of Miss Frizzle from the Magic School Bus. I know, it's sad. They had to dig her up. The police think her husband might have killed her. Oh, <sighs> so finally the kids are safe. The witches are glitter now <laughs> and um, the sun is up. So November, Danny and Allison and all three kids say bye Billy and he just peacefully closes himself back into a coffin. Wouldn't have been cool if he also had some skin in the game like uh, Winnie's spell was gonna make him a zombie a servant to her for eternity unless they could restore his tongue that she had in a glass jar. You know, like I'm just saying. Oh, Binks the cat, he's dead. Well, he's not dead but like the cat body of him transcended. <laughs> He's gone. He's gone, Danny. But he can't die, remember? You really think Allison wouldn't remember a little bit earlier when the talking cat told her it was immortal? You think she wouldn't remember seeing it reinflate after getting hit by a bus? What a dumb question. She's in the same exact movie as you, Danny. You defeated the antagonist. Look at that sunrise. Listen to the triumphant music. It's giving story resolution, sweetie. And in this case, that means the soul of the 16 year old boy gets to move on to heaven and not have to inside of a box in your guest bedroom until the universe explodes. We thought maybe you could be cool about that, even though you wanted him as a pet. That's the other thing before she's like, I'm gonna take care of you and feed you tuna and my my children and my grandchildren will all do it. It's like, but he's not a cat. You could feed him human food. He's talking English. You could treat him like a human, like Salem from, 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 from Sabrina. 
Oof, it is 1 a.m. soon. So I'm talking, I'm mixing up all my witch references. Uh, so yeah, the cat is no longer a cat, but Thackeray comes back as a ghost, <laughs> transparent ghost. And Danny is crying. I'm like, you just met him and he's a cat. I would be weirded out to see him as a human the first time. I'd be like, ooh, well, how is your hair still sweaty after 300 years? I don't care. I had to wear a shirt like this when I was like in the ensemble of Rodgers and Hammerstein's Cinderella. Ugh, I hate these like shirts. Like, I get it. I get it. We had huge sleeves back then. But even though Danny's emotionally overcome by this ending, she gets some encouraging words from her new ghost friend. <laughs> That is the sweetest depiction of a demon attaching itself to a human being that I've ever seen. My demon just jumped out of a possessed music box while screaming. Like that's intentionally trying to scare me. How is that helpful to anyone? So anyway, of course, stupid Danny gets a kiss from Tuck Everlasting on her tear-stained cheek. Whew, darn, I really thought this video would help me work through some of the feelings of jealousy I have for Danny's whole life, but I think it's gotten worse. Like if anything, I'm closer to starting a mean-spirited Facebook page about how much I hate her. She's a fictional character that's not against Facebook's rules. I don't know the rules, I don't read that shit. I don't use Facebook. <laughs> Seems like it'd be fine though. Can I be mean to fake children? I'm not asking, I'm just gonna do it. Anyway, speaking of children, Thackeray gets called by his ghost sister who he hasn't seen since those witches were sucking her life force. And she's like, Thackeray, Thackeray Binks, which is just like the most memorable line delivery of any girl yelling out ever. Also, the sun is rising over this um, graveyard. And I'm like, where did the town go? There's just fields now around them. There was road there before. Anyway. What took thee so long? I'm sorry, Emily. I had to wait 300 years for a virgin to light a candle. Yep, and it was just as random and unusual to watch as it sounds when you say it like that. And again, why is this movie treating characters who are eight years old like they would know what a virgin is enough to make fun of Max for it? Like, she's a transparent child who died centuries ago, and she's wearing a knitted bonnet. And like, that's a child. What? It, why would she know what a virgin is or care? Like, is she supposed to be like, Max, bro? Bro, is that true that my undead cat brother is your only experience with pussy? Well then, tis my duty to see that we get thou laid before graduation day. Tally ho to the adult video store. And that's the plot of Hocus Pocus 2. Ghosts help Max lose his virginity. No, I'm just kidding. It's gonna be some other bullshit which we get set up for because back in the museum, yeah, the museum, the a book's eyes open. Also, the parents leave their dance party all tired. Like I said, this movie lost money when it came out in 93, but it was released on home video the next year. And every year since then, the Halloween sales have reached over a million dollars on streaming and home media, which is successful, but I can see why it would take 20 years of that before they're actually actually like, okay, we can make a sequel now with all the nostalgia bait that's going on. Also in 2015, Disney parks started including the Sarah Sanderson sisters in all of their Halloween entertainment at Mickey's Not So Scary Halloween Party, along with the heavy presence from Jack Skellington and Oogie Boogie Man, all these characters from the other Halloween movie that came out in 93, Nightmare Before Christmas. In fact, that was the reason they had Hocus Pocus come out in July. They didn't want it to compete with the more expensive and more commercially successful right away movie, Nightmare Before Christmas. Saying a lot of holiday names today. So anyway, what do you all think of Hocus Pocus? Am I crazy or are there parts of this movie and the plot line that I'm like, those don't seem strung together? You know, I make fun of Disney movies that are based on an obscure novel, but at least then we had a real writer think about how to connect all the threads. This just feels like the subject of many rewrites mixed with cliches about, uh, you know, witches mixed with, I don't know, that girl, that little girl with her ratty hair. Yeah, I got one more dig in at you, Danny. Oh, happy Halloween. <laughs> let me know what you think in the comments below. And also let me know if you've seen Hocus Pocus 2, what elements from this get carried over? Is it as good? Is it as bad? Is it as sad? Did it give you the 90s nostalgia that you needed to make it through one more day in this capitalist hellscape? Sound off. Also, make sure you give this video a big thumbs up if you wanna see me cover even more classic Halloween content before the month of October is over. Also, make sure you hit that subscribe button right over here. That way you never
never miss new videos from me. I upload two new ones every week. So turn on notifications because you don't wanna be the last to know when my book's eye is opening and looking at you. Also a reminder that I have a Patreon where you can catch my upcoming Hocus Pocus 2 live stream as well as months of back content and merch like my brand new uh, enamel pins with some clip breakdown iconography. All of them sell for about $9.50 plus shipping and tax and uh, you'll get them shipped out to you right away. This is not a pre-sale, so represent. You guys are all the greatest. Thank you so much for eating way too much candy and drinking way too much caffeine considering the time that I'm shooting this at. You guys are all the greatest. Uh, cast a spell on you. Uh, I'll see you next time. Happy Halloween.